All right. Thanks, Pastor Stephen. That's what introductions are, right? They're like, wow, this person's so amazing, so awesome. And you're like, who is that? I want to meet that person. That, that's me. Let's see the picture of my fam. Put them up. There's my kiddos. Mike's a pilot. And uh, we flew for two years in South Africa and then 17 years in Brazil, right in the Amazon. Flew a float plane. It's... Um, for pilots, it's like the dream job. It was amazing. We loved it. Mike would be like, oh, I have to wait for a couple of hours for these storms to blow over. I'll just fish off the float and catch some piranha. Seriously, all of that, all of that is, it was really amazing. Indians and stuff. And, and our display is kind of pitiful today because I drove up and totally forgot to bring stuff for the table. But tomorrow there will be blowguns and bows and arrows out there. So, and Pete the piranha. We always bring Pete the piranha. Sorry, Pete. Where's Pete? He's out there. Pete the Piranha's name for you, and um, so he'll be at the table too. But um, like Pastor Stephen was saying, uh, I love missions. You know my dad, he's, uh, some of you know him, Pastor Rich, he's impossible to be around and not get a clue that he's all about missions, and that's the way I grew up. And um, I just, like when I was growing up, when I was about 10 or 11, I was going, God, I want to be a missionary when I grow up. Please, God, let me be a missionary and uh, when I went to college, I went to a Christian school in Texas, Laterno University, and they had a mission speaker come for a spiritual emphasis week or missions emphasis or something, and he preached about missions. And when he opened the altars, I ran to the front of the altar, and I was bawling before God. And I was like, God, I surrender to your will. I'll stay in America if you want me to. <laughs> and that was like... I just totally wanted to be a missionary. This is just my heart. And so God's like, okay, that's cool. I need to know you were going to obey me. And, you know, you can do that thing you love. So I met Mike in college, and we went to South Africa. Ben was born there. Ben, Ben's in the white shirt. He's 21. Some of you guys know him. We, we lived here and uh, went, we're part of youth group for a year and stuff. And um, so when, when he was filling out forms, he turned 18, right? So he had to fill out forms for... I don't know, in case they do a draft or something like that and to vote. And he's filling out the forms, and, and he was born in South Africa. So he goes, Mom, what about this block here? Do, um, I'm African-American, right? <laughs> and I go, Ben, no, you're not African-American. That's code for black. You just have to put white. It's like, what? Aw. So he marked white on the little box, right? A little out of the loop, but... He's coming up. He's coming up. He's off at college now and, uh, and has done some missions himself. We're not sure what God's call is for him, but Mika with the curly hair has taken her gap year this year, and she just did a YWAM DTS in South Africa, Cape Province, and her outreach was to Greece, wait, Turkey, Greece first, and now she's in Turkey. So she's in Turkey right now, and, uh, and she'll start school in the fall. So my other kids are still in school. Megan's 17. They're all awesome. They're all awesome. They all love Jesus, and, um, and we're so blessed. We're so blessed. So right now, um, we moved back to America in 2010 after 20 years of doing stuff overseas, and now we live in North Carolina for five years while my teens are graduating from high school and kind of getting launched, and so now we work at a missions training center called JARS, J-A-A-R-S, Jungle Aviation and Radio, Radio Service. And Mike trains new pilots that are going into missions, and I work with cross-cultural training. And while we're here in the States for these five years, I've gone back to school, and I'm getting my master's in global studies, which is code for missions. And um, so I'm learning a ton about what's happening all around the world, because we were kind of stuck in our little corner of the Amazon, right, doing our thing with Indians and tribes and stuff. And um, I've just been... Ex my, my brain's like about to explode. It's amazing. I'm in my fourth, fourth semester and uh, learning so much about what's happening in missions and where we are right now in the world as far as God's big picture. So, you know, like scripture is one big story. It's one big story from when God created us people for relationship because he loves us, right? In the fall, the relationship was broken, and God's like, but I'm going to make a way because you and me, we're going to be tight. So we're going to heal this relationship that's broken now. And so he shows them through sacrifice, starts doing animal sacrifice, and there's like a whole bunch of the Bible that's confusing, but that's what it's about. It's about getting to God, God making a way for people to get to him, even though we're messed up. 
and broken. And, um, and all of it is pointing to Jesus. All of it's pointing to Jesus, right? And Jesus comes and he tells his disciples, you guys, open your eyes. Read your Bible again because it's all about me and my story. This is God's story, this big story. And that's how he builds the church, right? And now we come to God through Jesus. And eventually, we're going to be with him in heaven, so the disciples, they, they're like some prophecies, uh, men of God in the Old Testament that had said some stuff was going to happen. So they're curious, and they're, they're like, Jesus, you're, you're a prophet. You know, you hear from God. So when is it going to be like the end? When is the end going to come? So they asked Jesus that. <clears throat> and he told them, things are going to get worse. There's going to be wars and earthquakes. There's going to be natural disasters. And some of this stuff we already see, it's pretty cool. And, um, and then he says in Matthew 24, oh, not that it's, uh, sorry, that came out totally wrong. <laughs> not that it's cool that we see wars and natural disasters. It's so cool that Jesus obviously knew what he was talking about, right? And we can, sorry. <laughs> all right, all right, stay on track. Um, so then he says, and this gospel, that, that just means good news, this good news about the kingdom of God, this is Matthew 24, verse 14. This good news about the kingdom of God will be preached in the whole world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So Jesus, like, lays out this, like, timeline for us. Okay. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and that word nations, what's translated nations in English, but the root for it in Greek is ethnos. Do you get what that's the root of in English? Ethnic groups and all ethnic groups. So not all geographic nations, like there's, what, 196 geographic nations, but there's a lot more ethnic groups, a lot more people groups, tribes and languages. And then the end will come. So when we think about missions then, missions is like um, us just, telling our story about what God has done for us because it's so amazing how God has rescued our lives from our brokenness and then fit us into his big plan, this huge epic plan, this story, right? And we're like Bilbo or something in his big story of redemption, and, and there's purpose in that, and there's calling, and there's meaning. And so then I'm like, okay, God, the, the, this gospel kingdom, preach all over, and then the end will come. And the disciples were there 2,000 years ago, and they're hearing Jesus say that. And right away in the churches, like in the first 100 years, people quit their jobs. They just sit around in church singing songs, waiting for Jesus to come back. Because he said he's coming right back, right? This gospel was going to preach, and he was going to come right back. So I'm a little weird this way, but I'm like, well, what about the people, you know, I kind of feel like Jesus is going to come back in my generation. I think he's coming. I think he's almost here. But I bet people 500 years ago thought that, <laughs> right? I bet, I bet people like 100 years ago thought, oh, Jesus is coming back in my generation. Look at the news, whatever. So I'm thinking, how close are we? Well, it's awesome that we live in the generation we do because research statistics are all there. And so I've got it for you tonight. This is how close we are to the end of the story, okay? Put up my slides. Oh, skip this one. We'll come back to this in a sec. All right, so right now in the world, if we had, if we were representing the whole world population as 10 people in this room, one of those, one-tenth of the population of the world, right? One of those people would be somebody that's like, Jesus, he's amazing. I live for him. Totally sold out radical Christians. You guys are already reading it, right? That's so lame. (laughs) All right, all right. So that's one-tenth, true follower of Jesus. Two-tenths are what they call nominal Christians. So their name is somewhere on the list of a church that calls itself Christian. They don't really know Jesus that well. So not sure where they are. I don't don't want to even talk about, you know, getting to heaven or all of that sort of thing. But they're not sharing their faith. Don't count on them to share their faith. Okay? That's two-tenths of the world's population. They're nominal Christians. All right? Four-tenths of the world's population have some access to the gospel, but they're not interested. That would be like, you know, classmates, neighbors. They've heard the story. Maybe they grew up in church and got burned. 
And they're like, yeah, I know about that Christianity. Don't even talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Right? Four tenths. Um, or they live in a country like the U.S. where if they're hungry for God, they could turn on Christian broadcasting or listen to Christian, or they could wander into a church and ask a pastor some questions. It's around them, right? There's a little bit of an access. Okay. And at the bottom there, three-tenths, Jesus. Who's that? The last 30% have virtually no access to the gospel. They have no neighbor, no relative, no friend that knows Christ. They may have never heard of the name Jesus Christ before, and they certainly have never heard about God's big picture and how Jesus can rescue their broken lives. They've definitely never heard that. Three-tenths of the world's population. That's pretty intense. Um, the bummer is, is most of those three-tenths are very far away. Most of them are Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims. Most of them are. Most of them are like in Bangladesh, China, Indonesia, largest Muslim population in the world, Iran, hard places. They've never met a Christian. Okay, hit the next slide. These are people, this just came out this fall. This has wrecked us as a family. These are people who live in North America who have never met a Christian. Isn't that messed up? As far as they know, so maybe the Starbucks girl loves Jesus, but they don't know she's a Christian. As far as they know, they've never met a Christian. Never met a Christian. And they go to school with us. They shop in our grocery stores. They live right here in North America. They are not in Bangladesh. They might be Bangladeshis, but they live here. They live right here. Isn't that cool? Look at that. So I want you to pair up with the person next to you, and I want you to think about an encounter you had this week with somebody that might be off of one of the lists on the left. You see, so let's not talk about, well, you could talk about agnostics or atheists, but maybe a Buddhist or a Chinese folk religion, whatever that looks like, or a Muslim or a Jainist or a Hindu or a Sikh, those are the guys with the turbans that work at airports, or a Zoroastrian. Okay? So, <laughs> I'm serious, they are. Um, so pair up with the person next to you and think about a person you bumped into this week that probably their name is on this list. Go. All right, bring it back. Bring it back. Okay, so that person that you bumped into, never met a Christian, has no clue. Um, when we read this in August as a family, we live now in North America, right? We live in North Carolina. And um, so when we read this article in Christianity Today, we are like, what, right here? Unreached people groups, there's probably some of these in North Carolina. There is. Huge Muslim population, huge, huge Indian Hindu population. There's refugees from Africa, from East Africa. So we prayed as a family, and we're like, God, will you bring someone off of this list into our lives this fall? Because now we're bringing the bar way down low, okay? We're just like, okay, our only goal here is to just be nice, be a friend to this person, and make sure that they know that we are Christians. Because if nothing else, maybe there's no opportunity to say the name Jesus Christ or to tell them about the big story or how Jesus can redeem their broken lives, whatever. But at least we want them to walk away going, you know, that was a really cool family. They're Christians. Yeah, never knew any Christians, but they were pretty cool. We wanted that. 
So, less than a week later, I go with my eighth grade son to, uh, to class, and he's, like, getting all his classes and meeting all his teachers, you know. And, and sure enough, there's a family there from India that just moved into our neighborhood. And so their son goes to school with Matias, my son. So we introduce ourselves, and I'm like, oh, hi, I'm Jody. And then they say these words. I'm like, oh, ha, ha, nice to meet you. They were saying their name, but, of course, I couldn't catch it, right? So in the car on the way home, we're like, yes, there's our family. Mati, figure out what that guy's name is. So he's like, I know he said it, Mom, but I don't know. So it took us about a week. We got his name, Raghav, in case you were wondering. Raghav. And, um, and Raghav and his family, since then, we've befriended him. Matias took incredibly spicy, off-the-chart chili peppers that we grow just for fun. He took those to school and shared them with Raghav in the cafeteria, so he had this crying, snotty experience. They bonded, you know, and um, they almost got in trouble, but that worked out okay. And uh, then we had him over to our house, and first I was like, um, so what kind of dietary restrictions should I think about? I don't know anything about Hindus, right? I'm researching frantically online. And she go, I go, she goes, no, we eat everything. I said, oh, so you eat meat? You're not vegetarians? Because some Hindus are, right? And she goes, no, no, of course we eat. Well, not beef, of course. I'm like, oh, no, of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wouldn't dream of serving her beef. So I'm like, oh, okay, what do we serve, you know? So we came up with, like, fajitas. And it was great. And we had them over, and we had a great night. We prayed in Jesus' name for the meal. They were so sweet, so friendly, so open. They're really open-minded. Always go to God, you know. And, um, and then uh, we chatted about getting together another time, so they invited us to their house when they bought a brand new home, and they had the Hindu priest come in to bless it and to offer offerings to the idols. So I'm like, oh, wow, love to come. So we're frantically researching, like, you know, what all do we do? We don't want to worship the idols, you know, so how far do we go? And how far is too far? And, and then they give us little goodie bags at the end. We meet their friends. And, and uh, then afterwards, Megan's with the goodie bags like, Mom, they offered those, you know, that fruit to the idols. I don't know if we should eat that. And so we're having all these cool conversations. Like, how cool is that? We're in North Carolina and having this conversation about, you know, what not to do to not worship the idols of the Hindu gods. And I'm going right here in our backyard, right here in our backyard. So I think that's pretty cool. And like I said, um, you know, we don't know if Raghav and his family are going to come to Christ this year. Matthias is transferred to a different school, and they won't be classmates anymore. But we really wanted them to know that they knew a Christian family that loved and respected them. And so that's happened. That's pretty cool. Okay, so how many of us Christians, like how big is the church, how big is the job? Hit the next slide. All right, so those little guys... At A.D. 100, that's about when the Apostle John died, when he wrote the book of John, the Gospel of John. And um, see that? That was one Christian. The little guys are Christians. And the ball that they're carrying is how many non-Christians? One Christian to 360 pre-Christians. 360 pre-Christians to every one Christian. That was a lot of work. Those apostles had to work hard right, the early church, but it's happening, it's happening, you see the little balls are getting littler, you're already ahead of me, and this is today, um, one of us, sincere Christ followers, disciples, who share our faith, to how many non-believers, one, two, say it again, one to how many, whoa, that's not that many people, one to seven, one of us, to seven people who need Jesus. I'll take seven. You take seven. Right? One to seven. That's not bad. Things are definitely happening. God's on the move. God is on the move. And the job's getting smaller. The job's getting smaller than it used to get. Um, now, if you would, sorry to do this, slide number two, which we skipped ahead of. Another incredibly exciting thing that's happening in the world is that it used to be that most Christians were like me, white, English-speaking, from North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand. That's where most Christians were from, up until 100 years ago. 
And we went as missionaries to the rest of the world. We white people, English speakers who love Jesus, went and sent and did a great job telling people in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia about Jesus. Right? And God moved, and he's doing his thing. And now, so all this other stuff is speculation. Erase that side on the right. My mom actually wants me to make this thing again because it bugs her that that stuff's over there. Don't speculate, but just look at us today, the actual numbers in 2010, okay? The red line is us white people. I'm using that as like a, you know what I mean? It doesn't mean that we're necessarily white, but it's North Americans and Europeans, that's the red line. We're still growing. We're still reaching Europe and North America and the Pacific, Australia, New Zealand. We're reaching them. But check out what the rest of the world's doing. Do you see that? That's Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Absolutely exploding with the gospel. Absolutely exploding. It's incredible. It's incredible. I didn't bring more numbers because after a while it's like, oh, whatever thousand to whatever. You're like, oh, huh, okay. But um, what God is doing in those places is outstanding. And it's gotten to the point now where the churches in Africa, Asia, and Latin America love Jesus so much, they're reading their Bible. And they got a great commission too. And Jesus told them to go and tell everyone. So right now in the world, cross-cultural missionaries, that's people like me, that go to work with another people group where you have to learn a different language and culture, okay? So it's not just like, dude, you're a missionary because you're reaching out to your friends around you. But it's like, no, no, you left your job and you went away. You had to do language classes and learn a new culture. So it's full-time, the full-time missions thing. A half of us in the world are like me, Europeans, North Americans, Australians, English-speaking. The other half of the cross-cultural missionaries in the world are not. They're from the rest of the world. They're from Brazil. They're from India. They're from Korea, South Korea, largest sending missions nation in the world. They're from Nigeria. Nigeria is sending missionaries everywhere. They're totally bold. And their churches are supporting them. And they're going because they're like, well, you know, Jesus didn't say only English-speaking disciples should go to the world. He wants us to go too, and they're doing it. It is so awesome. So any more now in missions, before we send new missionaries out, we do pre-field training, and we have to teach us how to work with multicultural teams. Because when you get to the mission field, you know, your church planning team might have one dude from Holland and a couple from Brazil and a guy from Ghana and a New Zealander and then an American. And that might be who's on your church planting team anymore. So like getting along and cultures and stuff is a really big part of what's going on. Okay. Um, then I ask myself, of us Jesus lovers, right, sincere followers of Christ, how many of us are actually sharing our faith? Good job. Thanks for raising your hand. I wasn't, I wasn't looking for a show of hands. <laughs> you guys are so sweet. Oh, man, I love that. And guess what I discovered? Give me the last slide. I love this. Okay, it's a really bad picture. My dad did that with his iPad out of the magazine. But it's in Christianity Today. But I couldn't find the original picture anymore. Look who's sharing their faith. The rest of church people are sort of dropping, dropping off. Only a third of us share our faith. Of you millennials, two-thirds of you share your faith. Did you know that? You guys, your generation. So this is anybody between like 18 and they say 34, if you were born from 80 afterwards. But it's like in their 20s, right? Early 30s. Millennials share their faith better than any of the other generations sitting in a church. I had no idea. Give yourselves a round of applause. Seriously, I love this. I love this. So I've been asking people, I was asking one of the girls out here earlier, why, you know, what's going on? And she said, well, you know, I don't know a lot of like theory and stuff. I just came to Jesus really a couple of years ago. My story's kind of long and complicated, but it's my story. 
So I tell my story to people I care about. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly right. You don't have to have a degree in how to share Jesusism. You know, just tell your story. Tell your story because if Jesus has done something that's changed your life, and if you really care about that person that you're talking to, well, hello, shouldn't you give that to them? Because that's not very loving if you don't, right? If you just let them carry on blindly, hurting, broken, wishing they had answers, and, and you've got answers, but you're hogging them. And so the millennials get that because millennials are all about authenticity and relationship. And that is one of the most encouraging things that I've heard in my degree program. I think that is so amazing, so amazing, because the numbers are such that you guys could be the last generation. You could be the ones. So of ethnos in the world, there are approximately 7,000, 7,000 language groups. Of those 7,000, 5,000 of them already have God's word. Less than 2,000 still, they don't have anything of the Bible in their language. Of course, they're those hard-to-reach ones, right? I'm being honest with you. The job is smaller, but it's the hard ones that are still left because God needs a generation that's radical, that'll step up and be like, yeah, you know what? Bring it. I'll go. Bangladesh? Where the heck is that anyway? Sure. <laughs> you know? Uh, so they don't like Christians. That's cool. I'm just telling my story. And off we go with the gospel, and we could be the last generation. That, to me, is very encouraging, very encouraging. So um, bringing it home for you, um, at Missions Conference, of course, everybody always says this. They're like, well, you know, everybody's missionary. Okay, that's cool. Everybody's missionary. Go tell the people that you love about Jesus. I want you to do that. But you can't really take the word missionary. You can't have it because that's another thing. Otherwise, we've got to invent a new word, right? We're not going to do that. Missionary is when you go, no, this is going to be my career. That other plan that I had for myself, I like this plan better. This is God's plan. And uh, I don't want to settle. And it's not going to be about money. And, um, you know, other people can choose so I'm not going to judge because God needs some people everywhere, but I want to be totally sold out. And uh, so this, this weekend, that's the first challenge I want to give you. In every generation, a good chunk of you have to step up and say, that's me. That's me. I'm, I'm not going to do anything else. I want to serve God totally. This can be my job. Okay, there's that whole raising support thing. That's a, it's awkward. I know, we hate it, but you know what? I've faced harder things before. God can do this. He's got it. He's faithful, and you know, it's humbling. It's so good. I need humbling, and, uh, and I have to depend on other people. Uh, well, let's go. I'm going to need you guys. I'm going to depend on you. So some of you have to take up that baton and be like, yeah, I think this is God. I think this is what I'm meant to do. This is what I was created for. And, you know, I'll go to the really hard ones. Some of you need to do that. Some of you need to be just a tiny bit more intentional here. Right? That chart, that chart with those lines, that's not in Bangladesh. That's in New York State. That's on Long Island. Every single nation in the world has immigrants on the book to the United States of America. You can find them all, all 196. They're here, every single nation. So we just have to be a little more intentional about reaching out while we're here or if you're called here, right? Not always hanging out with people that look just like us, talk just like us, but reaching out to some people that are still learning the language because they just got here for whatever reasons, right? And they're hurting, and they're looking for a friend and a community to belong to. So that's the second challenge, to take it up a notch with being intentional to reach out across those cultural barriers. Because what happens is people from China come to New York, and they live in Chinatown, and they shop at Chinese markets, and they go with their Chinese families to Buddhist temples, and we don't ever talk to them. And somebody's got to, like, 
be a friend in the Chinese restaurant and learn their name and hang out with them and, and reach out to them and let them know that, they're, that you're a Christian. Okay, so that's the second challenge that I want you guys to pray about is how can you be more intentional? That person that you bumped into this week that probably is on that list, what could you do differently? Just to start to, start to reach out, start to create a relationship, start to make something happen there, right? So that's the second challenge. And the third one I want to tell you is that um, all the time, whatever it is that you love to do, whatever it is that you're good at, always be telling God, God, I can do that here or I can do it someplace else. Because um, this whole being a part of God's big story thing, it's his story. And we're like the extras, right? Think about how awkward that would be if you were like an extra in a Denzel film. You're the waitress. You're serving coffee. Denzel's there in a conversation with somebody, and they're figuring out the murder, right? And you're like, <laughs> hi, to the camera, because you think it's about you. It's not. It's about Denzel. Get out of the scene, right? And, but sometimes we do that with God. Don't we do that? This big story is about God, and we're just like, oh, God, you make me so happy. So now I'm fulfilled. It's all about me. We sing these worship songs because they make us feel good, and God's like, oh, that's cool. I love you. Um, join my story, would you? <laughs> you know? And so there's also a time when we've just got to be like, God, I'm your servant. I know I'm your kid. I know I'm like, I'm, I'm, I tell you, I know God loves me. I am his favorite. He, he loves me, right? But he doesn't want me to just sit around loving me. He also wants me to be his servant for his kingdom. He wants to count on me. He wants me to be a warrior princess like the elf chica that rescues uh, Anyway. Um, I don't know where that was going. But he wants to be able to count on me as a warrior for his kingdom, right? And whether it's a soldier or a servant, when the master gives you a command, you just obey You don't be like, no, no, I have plans. And so that would be the last thing I would challenge you is just always be like, okay, God, I'm making some plans. He's got to make some plans. But I don't know, always, whatever you want, Lord. I want your will. Your plan A is the best plan. Worship guys, you can come on up if you'd like. Your plan is the best plan, and that's what I want. So those are the three challenges. We're going to go back to some worship because I want you to talk to God. I want you to hear God because it's entirely possible today that the Lord's telling you, you're the one, set aside the plans, this is going to be plan A. I want you to just let go of everything and choose missions as a career. Or he might be saying, that person that's different, that's in your class that you've kind of been ignoring, I need you to reach out to them. It's going to be a little awkward at first. Push through because they need Jesus, right? Or he might be saying, always keep it on the table. Always keep it on the table. And that might just be all you need to say to him today, God, here or wherever, it's always on the table, whatever you want. I am not going to lock myself into my plans because I'm your servant. You command and I'll go, right? So I want you to pray about those three things tonight as we worship some more. Okay, stand up. I'm going to pray you into it. So Father God, I just thank you that, I thank you that it is all about you, that it is your story, that your narrative is epic. God, it's, it's amazing and it makes sense. And our stories make sense when they're embedded in your story and, and your redemption that we've seen here in our own lives. That's the answer that you have for other people that are pre-Christians that don't know you yet. And so now, Holy Spirit, we're going to worship a bit more. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to each person in this room, including myself, and you would show us where you want us to step it up. You would show us what it is that you want from each of us. We want your plans for our life, your plans for our lives. So speak to each one. I pray that each person would hear you clearly and that they would have the courage 
to choose to obey you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to us.